Hi, it's Todd of Todd Stuff here, talking about scabbards today. So, this is a uh, mid 15th century longsword scabbard, actually for an Albion Agincourt. Now, I make scabbards for all my own swords, for Albion swords, lots of those as well. Um, but basically any sword, as long as I have the blade to work around. Now this one here, if we look at the features, you've got a wooden core inside covered by leather, which is by far the most normal way of doing it. Now, up the back here, I have a sewn seam. Um, sometimes they glued them, sometimes they sewed them. I generally prefer sewing, sometimes gluing is the way to go. A uh, scabbard knot here, basically uh, a way of suspending uh, the scabbard from, from your belt. And there's a couple of ways you can do that, we'll talk about that in a minute. We have two risers here, which are just lumps in the leather, um, which stop the straps moving up and down, so it keeps everything in place. This one has a bronze shape. Uh, bronze, absolutely the, the standard uh, type material for shapes and for belt fittings. They did use iron and they could use iron, but it wasn't so common. Note at this point that a shape on the end of the scabbard, popular throughout history, but not always. So lower grade scabbards, maybe not. 14th century, they seem to like not having shapes at all. Um, and again, actually further back into the uh, 10th century or so, shapes again, not quite so popular. Um, now, I mentioned that this has a wooden core. Now, there's a couple of really important things to note with that. First of all, whatever you do, do not have a scabbard made of a high tannin wood, like oak or chestnut. Because the tannin, call it tannin, but it's tannic acid. Acid in contact with metal will rust it. So basically, if you make a wooden scabbard, an oak scabbard, and put your sword in it, two weeks later it will come out a bundle of rust. Don't do it. So, um, low tannin woods, poplar is one. Uh, it's very tough. I know there's a lot of people who use birch. I've never used it for scabbards, but you know, a lot of respect to people do, so I guess that's fine as well. I also think that it probably has very, very similar properties um, to, to poplar. Poplar has got uh, some very particular properties that make it really suited to scabbards. So, uh, very low tanning content, no, no acid content, so it doesn't rust the metal. Clearly a good thing. It's also very light, very tough and easy to work. And what I mean by tough is I've got a bit of thin poplar here, um, about three and a half mil, eighth of an inch, and you can break it, no problem. But do you see how it stays connected? It's, it's tough. It wants, to, it wants to stay in one piece, yeah? And that makes it a really good scabbard wood. So again, you can see. So, although you can break it, and of course you can, it's thin, it's wood, but um, it does want to stay in one piece. So even if it cracks, you basically have still got a scabbard left. Now, if you come onto the rest of the scabbard here, no decoration on this particular one. Uh, decorated straps here, bit of stamped work. Uh, a bronze distributor. So basically, um, what happens here, there's a video on this, oh, another one here on Todd stuff, but, if you put your sword in there, quite clearly the whole thing's going to dangle about. Okay, you can see it. Now, if you put it onto a third point, so I'm just going to tie that belt off, and you put it onto a third point here, suddenly you end up with a sword, nice swing of the hips there, uh, which really wants to stay put. Now, the distributor itself, you've got to size it for you, but here it's a little bit over, but basically around about the small of your back and you adjust all the straps to suit but we've got that in another video so we can talk we can have a look at that anytime you want now I'll just whip this one off and I'll go through the scabbards that I have here starting with this one this is actually set up for an Albion Gadagelt uh, which is a 10th century sword I think from memory this particular sort of Z arrangement of the strap um, of the belt harness that seems to run really from the 9th or 10th century all the way through to about the uh, late 13th, early 14th, becoming less common, of course. But uh, as, a, as a layout, it's really quite a long-lived thing. The shape here, uh, it's bronze again, cast bronze. Particularly proud of it, it's a reproduction of um, the Brighthampton shape. Brighthampton is a part of this village. So the original of this shape was found about a mile, mile and a quarter from where I live. Um, this one is a little earlier, it's about 8th, 9th century, whereas the scabbard is, you know, a couple of hundred years later, perhaps. But the look doesn't change that much, so, you know, 
slightly anachronistic, but I thought I'd go for it anyway. Just pierce the back of the scabbard there. It just helps to stop anything moving around, sewn seam as before. This one, very often at this period, they would be lined. Now, I don't line my scabbards unless requested to. Um, this period, actually, I usually do, but that one's a stock piece. But uh, later on, I don't line them unless I'm requested to. They did do it, but very, very seldom, actually. So. Um, people say, oh, if you don't line it, the wood will scratch the steel or something. No, it won't. The benefit of lining is twofold. One is that you can have a slightly loose scabbard, I'll come to this, but it still holds a sword. Uh, and also that you can introduce grease into that lining, which will just keep the, the sword itself oiled. This one, Albion Arn, very famous sword, obviously, from the film. A um, bit of carved decoration at the top here. We have two straps coming to a slightly different cross-linked piece, uh, another one here, and then two sets of the thonging crossing around. Um, this type of scabbard, it's almost like the industry standard for scabbard makers of medieval reproductions now. You don't have to follow it slavishly. Sometimes there's two straps, sometimes one, um, sometimes they cross two. You know, they, they did all sorts of things. They didn't come out of a mould. So just as long as you end up with a scabbard that looks kind of something like this, it'll kind of be right. Bronze horseshoe shoe shape. Uh, a sewn back um, and this one again there's another video of this type it's what I call a French tie I'm sure it's got 58 different names to it but essentially get it sat on your hip nicely just a loop on the bottom one goes around on the top one just pull through pull it tight now what you end up with is, as you can see from me pulling it, it doesn't want to come undone. It sits nicely, uh, sits on the hip well, it stays close to me, doesn't swing about, which is, that's what's really important. You don't want the thing swinging about. You want to undo it, just pull it, and it's done. Now, I talked earlier a little bit about the lining. Now, the thing is, if you make a scabbard and it's really tight to the sword, feels beautiful, goes in, oh, look at that, oh, it's lovely. Isn't that wonderful? Goes in lovely. Look, doesn't come out, give it a little tug, and now it comes. Perfect, one might think. But don't forget, wood swells when it gets wet. So after a day or two days of campaign, this scabbard is gonna be holding that sword real tight. Now, the modern market wants these scabbards to be beautifully fitted like this. I actually, and I do it, that's what I do. But I actually don't think that that's the way it was really done because like I say, you're caught in a rainstorm for a day or two, you're not going to get your sword out. Now, but you know, it comes down to you. Uh, again, this is Albion Burgundian, another Albion sword, um, mid to late 15th century. Now this one here, it's got some stamp decoration on this panel here between the straps. At earlier periods, occasionally you would end up with decoration all over your scabbard. Uh, this kind of period, um, uh, I suppose late 14th, 15th century, even into the 16th, they tended to decorate perhaps this section of the scabbard, but not the whole thing on the whole. So there's just a little fairly subtle decoration there. You have the scabbard knots here. They're done in a very particular way that holds it. They, they look pretty and, and they work well. And I'll just film a little bit of that later. Um, and then again, bronze belt fittings here, much the same as the Agincourt scabbard earlier on. These particular fittings are done so they are permanently connected to the belt. You cannot undo them, okay? I also supply, uh, all, all of these are available through Todd's Foundry or Todd's Stuff. Just drop me an email um, if you're interested in, the, uh, uh, in all the sword belt fittings, but have a look on the site first, they're all there. Um, this sword belt is slightly different. This is um, a long sword by myself. This one is now detachable. So you can uh, separate the belt and the sword itself. It just unclips. But the setup of these is uh, all the same for the Albi and the Burgundian, uh, for the uh, Agincourt and the Burgundian, and for this one indeed. Um, the setup is the same. That you get the distributor over the small of your back, belt comes through, obviously get it the right kind of height, and then it comes like this. Now I haven't punched any holes in this yet. But so what you've got, there's a scabbard that sits there. The sword doesn't waver around too much. It's kept close to you. It's what you really want. Because in that way, it doesn't tangle with your legs and so on. So it's basically a better way of wearing it, less distracting too. But if we take this one off, 
The other principal difference here, obviously, is that we have metal fabricated fittings. Uh, these ones are done, again, obviously done by myself. Um, very heavy rib decoration, very typically Germanic. Um, but otherwise, this, uh, the same kind of system as the scabbard knots. This setup with the metal brackets seems to come in, as far as I can tell, around about the mid um, 14th century, perhaps a little bit earlier. And then finally, this one is slightly different. Uh, circa late 15th century Messer, um, also by myself. Uh, bronze tape, sewn up the back. So what's notable about this scabbard here, uh, it's for a Messer that I've done myself, uh, is we have two points, two pickup points here, that are very close together in terms of height. The earlier strap scabbards where you have a difference in height between the, uh, between the two sides of the belt, they actually wear quite well. Any sword that has two points like this, or God forbid, two points on top, which actually Europeans didn't seem to do, but they did seem to favour that in some Islamic countries. The sword is just flying everywhere. It's a horrible way to wear it. This one is not quite wonderful, but it's not quite horrible either. So what you've got going on here is two points which are almost on the same level, so you'd think that it, were, it swings around a lot. And if it was a long sword, and actually 15, 14th century, they had long swords on two points like that. But if this was a long sword, it would swing about. But because it's short and it's a messer, it's, it's pulled quite close to you, so it's fine. But the thing to note as well here is that because it's a messer, you've got a wide peak here. And that means that the whole scabbard needs to be parallel all the way up. What that means is the scabbard is wider at this point than the blade, and you inevitably get this rattle. Um, and looseness, there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's just the way they're set up. So we'll just have a look at some close-up scabbard details, but um, that'll be the end of my beautiful face. But thank you very much. Um, I hope it's been interesting.